seconds, please um, tell us what you think in the poll that's launched and tell us what intelligence means to you. Okay, I think we're just about three minutes in. Um, I will start off. So welcome to intelligence in the age of AI. Um, we are future fantastic, an impending festival, bringing art, art, AI art to India uh, to talk about stories of climate change. Um, Future Fantastic <clears throat> is pulled together by, okay, Future Fantastic is an ambitious AI art festival. We're hoping to manifest this in Bangalore in March of 2023. And this is really a product of a series of fellowships that we've done over the last three years. But most excitingly this year, under the India-UK season of culture by the British Council. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of really robust collaborative com commissions that have come out through these fellowships that we hope to showcase in the festival. In terms of our partners, um, Future Fantastic is conceptualized by Be Fantastic and Future Everything. We at Be Fantastic are from India, and we have been convening art and technology communities since 2017. But actually, much earlier than that, the team itself much earlier than that, under the umbrella of Jaga, um, which was established around 20, 2009 in Bangalore. Uh, Be Fantastic works with a three-pronged approach of bringing people together through COVID, mostly online. Uh, in fellowships, workshops, and we kind of create, make together. We are excited about showcasing, which is what this festival is all about. And then this third prong, which is why we're gathered here today, is the dialogue sessions where we bring in speakers to discuss pertinent subjects with our community. Uh, we partnered with Dara, who's our communications partner, and of course, supported by the British Council, um, Pro Helvetia, Swiss Arts Council, and the Goethe Institute of Bangalore. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Irini to tell us a little bit about Future Everything. And Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Kamia. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and for another dialogue session. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation with our amazing speakers. So Future Everything um, is an organization, it's a non-profit arts organization based uh, in Manchester in the UK and uh, who's, who's been around since 95 and uh, we've been working with um, art technology and uh, responding in uh, ideas around like um, and challenges, um, societal challenges and current challenges. So uh, a lot of the work that we do is uh, taking place in uh, public in the public realm. We don't have a venue ourselves, but we do collaborate with other organizations. We work across uh, the arts, but also other sectors trying to um, advocate for the role of art uh, in society, but also to bring art in non-art domains and engage with uh, audiences uh, in critical conversations around technology and the impact of technology in culture and society. And I'll pass back to Kamia. Thank you. And that's the partnership. I mean, most of the times Irini steals the words out of my mouth. <laughs> so it's lovely to be partnering with somebody doing very similar things across the globe. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. We have with us Virangana Kumari Solanki. Uh, Virangana is an <clears throat> independent curator and writer based in India. She's interested in the way interdisciplinary forms of creative practices merge and create dialogues in public and private spaces. 
Uh, Virangana was the 2019 Brooks International Research Fellow at Tate Modern, and she was also a resident at the Delfina Foundation. She is currently the program director at Space Studio Baroda and a core team member of Art Chain India and teaches the curatorial practice MFA course at the Kathmandu University. She's also, and very excitingly, she'll talk about it, curating the future landing, the arcade at the Serendipity Arts Festival this year. So Virangana, welcome. And I hand over to you for today. Thank you, Kamya. Um, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, depending on which part of the world you're logging in from. Um, welcome to Be Fantastic's fourth dialogue, as Kamya mentioned. Um, and thank you, Kamya, Irini, Jones, Kartika, Be Fantastic, and Future Everything teams for inviting me to moderate this evening's discussion with our two incredible speakers, Adrian Knotts and Anna Riddler. Welcome. So I'll begin with a short introduction uh, to this recent exhibition that I was involved with in a curatorial capacity, uh, Future Landing for Serendipity Arts uh, Virtual Festival in 2020. Uh, the exhibition which uh, adopted the form of a website and it still exists, um, is it, was an outcome of uh, various explorations, um, experiments with a group of artists and web developers and coders where what we attempted was an understanding of letting go of future as a relational time. And this was at a time where there was constant um, change and yet um, it was something where we were trying to understand the distinction between days that were blurred. We struggled with locating ourselves within spaces, within situations that we had been forced into um, at the time of something beyond our control, which was and still is the pandemic. Um, part of the grief was to consider change as a constant, knowing that anything that we create would be overcome with the internet speed of instantly dating something, uh, where once it was out there in the world, it would be old. And so we were keen to see how fast we could um, create this change or how we could keep change as a constant while thinking through future landing. And this dating of uh, anything that goes out there in the public realm, in fact, applies to any form of technology today and most certainly what we may refer to as the internet of things that operates through AI um, today. I'll share my screen briefly uh, just to touch upon how three aspects which I feel will carry forward in Adrian and Anna's presentations to uh, came across as propositions to experiencing future landing. And this was haptics, time, and technology. Uh, let me just share my screen before I take you all through that. Um, so what I'm also going to show you all is a previous, um, this is so before um, I'll play this while you're looking at it. And so something that Future Landing does is that um, because it's not a constant, what I am showing you right now is the previous iteration of Future Landing. The five artists who you'll see on the website, I'll put the link in the chat um, just after I finish, is um, are the five artists who these five artists nominated. And every time somebody came back to the screen, you'd experience something different based on your surroundings, based on um, the sound, based on how you interacted. And even the screenshots themselves on the landing page, which is the home page, uh, kept changing based on screenshots that it took across the five artists' pages. Uh, just to go back to haptics and how that came in, and again, thinking of what um, the pandemic did was isolate us in our individual spaces. So the sense of touch became fairly visual. Um, what some of us ended up um, landing up in situations where everything moved to the online, including reading groups. And that's where I was introduced to a book by Laura Marx called Touch. Uh, which talks about visual haptics. Um, and that was a huge inspiration and reference for future landing. 
um, and something that's carried forward in the artists who are on it today is again what was constant was change but also time and this loss of control that comes in so the five artists had the option to choose who they wanted to pass it on to the actors virtual studios in some way and the current five will subsequently do the same how technology comes in here and uh, which i hope we'll be able to expand on is that when we started researching on how we wanted to create something that was beyond just an online exhibition with images on it. Um, something which I did um, share with uh, our web developers who were a core part of how Future Landing was founded uh, was I went uh, while looking through the internet for websites that seemed to be the most challenging at that time, which already now in these two years seem dated. And, um, I think um, for a few of us who were on it thought we were crazy when we tried to code a website from scratch. But also when it came to working with coders and with developers to think through what machine learning would be, for instance, Farah Mullah's work, which asked people to switch on the microphones, picked up sound from their surroundings to create something. And we realized that um, for machine learning, what she wanted to do was still happening across three computers by some researchers in Berlin. So it was impossible to code this into the back end. Uh, but trying to, again, adapt to how we started thinking differently as a challenge of what future landing could be, it was both challenging technology as well as um, challenging what viewers would experience. And I think um, with that, I'm going to um, leave these three things of haptics, time, and technology to bring forward with both Adrian and with Anna uh, and see how we can explore this in relation to artificial intelligence with both the practices as well. Um, so moving on, I'll um, begin by introducing um, Adrian and Anna before we move into a group discussion. And um, in the meanwhile, if there are any questions that you will have or anything, you can drop them in the chat box and we'll bring them up at the end. Um, Adrian, Adrian is a curator for All Plus Art at ETH AI Center. Besides that, he is the curator of the Art Encounters Biennale 2023 in Timisoara. Before joining the ETH AI Center, he was the curator at Tichy Ocean Foundation, the artistic director of Gabriel Walter in Zurich, and the head of the Faculty of Fine Arts of the School of Design in St. Gallen. He curated a number of, um, new, sorry, he curated numerous data and contemporary art exhibitions, action conferences, intervention with artists, activists, and thinkers, mostly at Cabaret Walter, but also internationally. Anna, who joins us from the UK, is an artist and researcher who works with systems of knowledge and how technologies are created in order to better understand the world. She is particularly interested in ideas around measurement and quantification and how this relates to the natural world. Her process often involves working with collections of information or data, particularly data sets to create new and unusual narratives. Anna holds an MA in Information Experience Design from the Royal College of Arts and a BA in English Literature and Language from Oxford University, along with fellowships at the Creative Computing Institute at the University of Arts London. Her work has been exhibited at cultural institutions worldwide, including the BNA, the Barbican Centre, Centre Pompidou, HEK Basel, Arts Electronica, and there's more which I'll put into the chat. She was a European Union EMAP Fellow and the winner of the 2018-19 DARE Art Prize. Riddler has received commissions by Salford University, the Photographer's Gallery, Opera North, and Impact Festival. She was listed as one of the nine pioneering artists exploring AI's creative potential by Artnet and received an honorary mention in the 2019 Isaac Electronica Golden Nika Award for the category AI and Life Art. Welcome, Adrian. Welcome, Anna. Um, Adrian, I'll now hand this over to you. And um, 
if he yeah and if anybody has questions again please put them in the chat box thank you very much Virangana, and thank you Kamya and Irini for inviting me to talk here in the context of Future Fantastic. I'll also share my screen quickly um, to do a quick presentation. So um, one point which was also mentioned in the, how would you say, advertisement videos for this event um, was this idea of anarchistic intelligence. It is based a little bit on, on my past work with uh, Cabaret Voltaire and Dada, and also on the fact that I am a Chevalier de la Tombe de Bakunin. So the guy who you see here, uh, Mikhail Bakunin, is buried in Switzerland. And once a year, we meet at this grave to take care of the grave. But if I say that maybe anarchist uh, AI might mean anarchist intelligence, I like to refer more to a definition that David Graeber had, He's a, and he was an, an, an anarchist, an activist, and an anthropologist. He just published last autumn the book together with David Wengrove, which is called The Dawn of Everything. And he had a very simple definition, which is a little bit based on another great grandfather of uh, anarchism, which was uh, Proudhon. Uh, that would be that it is about mutual aid, voluntary association, and self organization. And I think there are certain aspects in this idea of anarchism uh, or anarchistic intelligence, like self-organization, for example, which we find in machine learning and, and um, reinforcement learning. Um, and then there's this maybe idea more related to intelligence uh, about mutual aid, the kind of social aspect, a voluntary association. We can find it in some new technologies like the blockchain technology or with the DAOs, the decentralized autonomous uh, organizations. Uh, there's even this word crypto anarchism in this context. And another aspect which I find interesting, especially with Graeber's view, is that he says that what the anarchists in the 19th century in Europe were basically doing was not so much like the socialists or Marxists or communists building up a new theory of how humans should live together, but more like looking around in different kinds of civilizations, how they are organized and um, how they work. So even in this book, Dawn of Everything, the basic idea is to say that maybe there is a way out of our um, global capitalist uh, uh, so-called democracies, which if you just not even only look backwards in history, but even into different areas on the globe to just basically change a little bit to to maybe get into a, a kind of an anarchist society. And I think these kind of hopes, especially in developing uh, this new technology of AI are important because finally, you know, we'll get away from the whole coding part, etc., to have it more as a daily used uh, application. And over there, and this is also a little bit the idea of the AI center, we will be uh, questioned more about how and why we are using certain applications and what implications they will have. So it will, it will be much more about questions of ethics and critical thinking, and maybe it makes sense to, to train our own machines, our brains a little bit more into that direction. Um, I'll just do a quick presentation of the AI Center. Um, so today, as you all know, um, AI is like um, this new technology. Uh, it has, as I noticed, I'm not very long in the field. It's like in a year now. Uh, there's basically one huge uh, kind of populistic discussion where it's utopian or dystopian. So AI will solve all our problems or AI will basically kill all of us. And then in this context, which where I'm here at the Technical Federal um, Institute of Technology in Zurich, it is very um, specific computer science, mathematics, uh, technological engineering discussions, which is for me as an outsider coming from the art field, very difficult to understand. And over there, one could say that natural language and computational language are very close together. But it is uh, an important um, technology uh, tool 
that is also shown that at the Federal Institute of Technology here, uh, all 16 departments are working with AI. That's from architecture, earth science, biology, health science, to environmental systems and, and also chemistry and uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, so we formed this uh, AI center. At the, at currently, there are 120 faculties connected to it, which includes 200 postdoc researchers, 1,400 um, PhD students, and the center itself also has 40 uh, fellows, which are working here, mostly in a cross-disciplinary um, approach. So sometimes it would be like computer science and health uh, care or uh, robotics and law or something like that. The mission of the AI Center is um, to lead the way towards a trustworthy, accessible and inclusive artificial intelligence with, for the benefit of society. And basically, one can say that uh, trust, accessible and inclusive means that it, we want to try and reduce um, the costs that are involved, make it more accessible, but also understandable, especially in, in the field of medicine. That's important to have it also in, interpretable. And uh, trustworthy AI is based on uh, four ethical principles that are actually quite fresh. It's something that was set up three years ago by a specialist uh, commission of the EU Council in their ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. And they are respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, and explainability. And this have seven requirements which you can see here human agency and oversight technical robustness and safety uh, privacy and data governance transparency diversity non-discrimination and fairness societal environmental well-being and accountability and i think these these inputs in terms of trustworthiness and uh, ethical ai are quite interesting because now you have these challenges for a lot of researchers and engineers to also basically translate it into computational language. So like words like almost philosophical or um, political words like individual rights, fairness, robustness, trust, causality, and so on are now trying to be translated into how one could basically program fairness in a hiring process, for example, or also other words more in the field of computer vision or also data processing like intuition improvisation perception and so on are not just a challenge for the computer scientists but also for me in this last year that i've been here also challenge a little bit our understanding of what it actually means when we say uh, improvisation in theater for example or intuition we feel like it's something that is specifically human but if you translate it into a code, it might be quite um, a simple explanation of what we think improvisation um, is. So the approach at the AI center is uh, a so-called collaborative AI. So this idea to, to not have autonomous AI systems, but to basically work uh, seamlessly together. Um, this has like three components. It's like the idea of adaptive lifelong learning. So not so much based on big data sets, but more on uh, reinforcement learning. It's idea of a shared understanding between the machine and the human, and also this seamless and intuitive interaction, which is maybe also a little bit what Verangana was talking about with the, with the touch and how you can you know, create this kind of interface in between machines and humans and in our ai and art program or initiative um, we are now uh, you know kind of opposed with this uh, problem in a way that a like thanks to these gan generated images thanks to nft blockchain etc nlp and so on basically everything has become or all visuals have become um, art and we're trying to work a little bit in into a different direction which is uh, more connected to uh, critical thinking and ethics. Uh, we're trying to also get artists involved in the research in the sense of diversifying uh, knowledge and also intelligence, uh, asking new questions, giving different perspectives, and in a way, in a very practical level, also give inspiration and vision 
and fiction for or of the future for these engineers and scientists that are working here. So I'm not quite sure how I am in time, but uh, is it okay? I just go on. You just go. You have about a, a minute left, Adrian. A minute, okay. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we have three fields of activities. So the idea is starting conversations with artists and scientists, bringing artists into labs, into having small conversations with them, doing public talks. Uh, here you can see Aparna, who's here at the ETH, Aparna Rao as well. Um, so this is for us, like the, let's say the lowest or easiest uh, level to try and engage artists and scientists. And in that sense, bring this kind of artistic and anarchistic intelligence into this uh, research. We do seminars, we are working on a couple of projects, and maybe the last project I want to mention is one referring again to David Graver, where we have, um, the, the, where we are lucky to work together with Nita Dubrovsky, David Graver's um, widow, and somehow we managed to collaborate with the ETH library, that's a library for the Technological Federal Institute here to basically do an open research data project with the David, David Graeber Institute. So to a certain degree, to kind of close the circle, we are trying to bring this kind of um, anthropologist, anarchist and activist knowledge into the ETH library and in that sense also into these databases that we basically are training our AIs with, I think. That was it. It's a rhino that was shipped from Goa to Lisbon in 1515. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Anna, I've got um, I've got plenty of questions, Adrian, in relation to how you spoke about collaboration. But before I bring that in, uh, we let. I mean, maybe Anna, you could present and um, then we can go into the discussion. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. Um, uh, so I am an artist. I'm I am an artist, I'm primarily an artist. Um, and for about the past five, six years, I have been working quite heavily with artificial intelligence as part of my creative process, um, not just as kind of like a tool, but as a way of working. So kind of like it's it's kind of embedded itself throughout everything from conceiving of a project through to making it, through to then kind of like how the installation works. And a large part of that for me is kind of constructing the science from the ground up, everything from the algorithm through to the data. And doing this kind of allows me to understand error states and assumptions and reveal kind of like the labor and process of making. And uh, kind of thinking about this in relation to intelligence and what is intelligence, and it's, it's particularly in relation to the huge leaps um, in kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning that have happened in the past um, year or so. Um, I thought it would be interesting to kind of like, for well, what I'm going to do, whether it's interesting or not, is kind of talk through kind of how some of these very, the latest advancements in it, and then kind of how that links to kind of some of my earlier work and what that kind of like, and how all of this kind of comes around this idea of intelligence and artificial intelligence. I think it's really interesting that even the name of um, the kind of process, which is normally kind of like, it's machine learning versus kind of artificial intelligence has become so loaded um with value about whether it's kind of true or correct or human or not human and for me kind of um the kind of the the summary of it is i suppose is that all intelligence um in this process is, is very driven by human and human decision making um but what is shown on the screen right now are some images that I created just, just before um, this kind of presentation started. Um, well, kind of I edited them just before this presentation started. They're generated using um, a, a system called DALI2, which is a, a text to image um, process. And it takes about 30 seconds for to render 
uh, 10 of these images. And it now has become kind of like almost like magic, this kind of way, this kind of process of making images, to making kind of um, these kind of um, these types of kind of, oh, sorry, these types of images. Um, it, uh, it kind of previously kind of like ideas around kind of like what human intelligence was, was very much linked to kind of human ability. So the idea that kind of like, previously kind of like uh, the ability to play chess incredibly well was seen as being like the pinnacle of human intelligence but now we have machines that can kind of play chess that kind of idea has kind of like lessened slightly um, and I think it's really interesting when you kind of start to apply that same principle to kind of notions of creativity um, now that you can have these kind of algorithms that kind of can produce kind of like images so quickly what will it mean for kind of like our conception of what creativity is um kind of and how will this kind of affect kind of our abilities as as kind of like to and our notions of what is human intelligence because i think creativity is very much tied to the idea of of human human intelligence I mean, really, like, so when you kind of see it happen, it looks like magic, it looks like some kind of digital witchcraft, but really what is going on, the process of it is it's you kind of like, it's a process that begins with kind of random patterns of dots that like slowly build up into an image. Um, and once you kind of like start to understand how it's working, this kind of idea around magic, this idea of it being this superhuman intelligence slowly starts to uh, fall away. Um, and I'm not going to talk that much about the algorithms, but I am going to talk um, about the data, the data um, and the, or the training sets that this that these are um, that are given to these that then kind of like builds up the knowledge that then the algorithm takes to kind of construct these images or to construct kind of text or construct whatever. Um, so DALI 2 or stable diffusion or, or any of these other kind of like um, kind of large um, text to image systems are all trained on billions and billions of images. And with DALI 2 and the other kind of more commercial ones, that those images are, the data set is closed. You don't know what's going on. Stable Diffusion has recently, uh, which is kind of the, a later, the latest one, is um, open source. So you can download it and play with it yourself without having to pay. And someone has recently built a tool where you can start to explore the kind of data set that sits behind it. Um, you can start to pull back the curtain and start to explore the data that is being used to kind of create these images. And once you start to do that, you realize kind of like how these images are being constructed. I think it's also really super interesting about looking at the text that kind of accompanies these images and how like mundane and prosaic it actually is. Um, but when you start to look at the images themselves, um, over half the images that they found kind of come from a hundred domains. So this kind of world of possibilities that you have is, uh, is narrowed quite significantly. And of those kind of um, 100 domains, by far and away, the largest amount is coming from Pinterest. So you can see that although you have these kind of systems where you can kind of put things in and kind of like get anything out, you can get kind of like the most crazy kind of like images, but they're kind of like the database from which they're drawn, kind of once you start to get into it, it becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, and for me, that's kind of like quite, it becomes quite interesting. You kind of start to kind of, uh, kind of like understand how these things kind of happen, how these things work and how important things, how important the kind of the layers that humans kind of like have put onto these kind of systems, the language, the classification becomes to, um, to these kind of the, the, the eventual output. Um, language is so important for making these systems work and language for me is so closely tied to human intelligence without kind of language without classification we essentially have no memory and no way to retrieve the information that we know it's necessary in order for us to to pull things back in order to retrieve kind of 
information, retrieve knowledge, retrieve kind of like our past experiences, both for us as humans, but also for machines or for algorithms. But language also is inherently problematic. It kind of like the idea of classification, the idea of being able to kind of cut the world up and kind of stick it into various point, parts, um, essentially kind of like will always end up kind of um, uh, leading back to kind of default kind of ways of, of tagging and thinking about the world so you can kind of for me kind of like looking through kind of like these databases and starting to see what's included and what's not included really kind of like quickly leads me to ideas around classification around encyclopedias around keeping knowledge and I think a really kind of like strong parallel starts for these kind of system uh, for these kind of databases starts to become Wikipedia, which is drawing from kind of is on the internet. It's draw it's it's kind of like um, what is there is what people kind of like um, put up. Um, there are kind of obviously like strong differences, um, but I think you can kind of like you can start to see in Wikipedia also the kind of subjectivity around categories and choices of those who are who are choosing to kind of like put things up or not put things up and so in many ways kind of training sets can be seen as being contemporary encyclopedias trying to describe everything in the world and to make decisions about what's important enough to record and inevitably those kind of like reflect the cultural and social social attitudes of the day um i and then I think so then I started thinking quite heavily about the ideas of, of encyclopedias um, and this is taken from a work that I did where I, I looked through kind of um, lots and lots of encyclopedias and kind of created my own data set by kind of um, taking the images from it and I think this kind of idea around classification and um, without thought and the histories that kind of the histories that are associated with encyclopedias um, and what that kind of and those connections to intelligence and what it means to be intelligent the fact that you know you have something telling you that this is this um, is very much there with training sets and by extension by artificial with artificial intelligence um, and what's interesting I think about kind of like looking through Kind of the histories of encyclopedias there's always been kind of like this um, um movement to kind of take encyclopedias and to cut them and to kind of um take images repaste things kind of re-edit things in people's own handwriting to kind of add information in or take information out which is what i feel artists are now doing with kind of ai and training sets and algorithms they're taking what is kind of like considered to be canonical and then working with that by kind of disrupting it or changing it or editing it to better reflect the world around um, around us and then how much time do i have uh, um, you have a minute left, Anna. Okay, so I just want to kind of end by playing a um, very early, this is one of the first works that I made with artificial intelligence, which was, uh, and you can already see the huge change in quality and ability um, of, to kind of produce images, because these were kind of like the best type of images that you could get at the time. Um, and this was a project where I was looking at archives and memory, and I think, and to go back to what I was talking around about memory and ideas of memory, for, because for me that really is kind of um, in a, a kind of intelligence, um, the, I, the ability to kind of like recall and to remember is really what distinguishes us, um, I think, and that ability to kind of like um, to know and to understand comes from our um our the way that we can kind of like um understand the world there's a kind of a very kind of like key difference between kind of data to information to knowledge data is just the kind of bits and zeros information is kind of that into kind of like um, something that kind of like uh, is a bit more of a fact and knowledge is what you do with that um information and I think that's kind of where where we are kind of like what distinguishes us from kind of artificial intelligence is our ability to kind of take 
to take the um, data and information and actually do something with it and to make something and create something that has a concept that has meaning that has kind of ideas um, and so that's kind of like very rambly kind of like my my thoughts on on the subject um thank you anna and um i'm gonna now invite adrian you both of you uh to a few questions i had i'll perhaps begin with um individual questions that i had for both of you and I have a list of other questions which I hope we can get through um, in time. Uh, but to begin with, um, Adrian, I'll begin with you. What you spoke about this idea of collaboration and this shared understanding between the humans and the machines. And um, to connect that with your slide that spoke about um, intuition, improvisation, perception, um, I just wanted to bring in the idea of the anarchist that you talk about when you refer to AI. And um, that the fact that we depend on machines to do this, does that in a way also take away the anarchy? We depend on what to do what with the machines? When, the way we depend on machines, uh, mm -hmm. because we teach machines thing, teach machine things uh, with the idea of them becoming intelligent enough to fill mm -hmm. in gaps for us, which is where this collaborative process comes in. Yeah. Uh, but does this also, in a way, take away from the anarchy that you refer to? Um, I mean, it depends what kind of definition you would take of anarchy. But as I said, it was this idea like of mutual aid and also voluntary association. So in that sense, you can say that um, you just you know, collaborate with an AI uh, when you want, in the sense of voluntary association, mm -hmm. and also um, mutual aid. So the idea is to have it, uh, as we understand it here at the AI Center, is like to have it more as a kind of complementary um, tool. So you can try and do, it's a little bit the promises we have from industrialization from 250 years ago, where we basically can get rid of the, how to say, uh, annoying tasks and delegated to the machines. Um, up to now, we never really managed to do that because jobs have become more and more, uh, we're working more than ever. But uh, so, yeah, so there's a one side, in, in general, we want to, we are kind of emphasizing on two fields. One is like this direct kind of seamless interaction with machines like robots or any kind of robots to have, uh, a kind of link into the let's say real world or the analog uh, world of objects and the other one is more maybe like a complementary form in terms of information so for example in in medicine you can use ai to help you with diagnosis or in the law you can an deep analyze uh, the law texts and or um, other cases better and get like a, a kind of recommendation system so it is in that sense, it can become something like, uh, it not just only can become, it actually is in a couple of fields, uh, an assistant in decision-making. And yeah, so that's something that the machines still can't really do, decisions and uh, planning. So that's to, a little bit this approach. To further intelligence in some way, could we say? Yeah, yeah. It's to, to help and to assist. Kind of. I'm going to come back to that. Um, that perhaps my next question, uh, uh, furthering from what you said, is for both of you, uh, because you've both referred to nature and science in some way when referring to AI. And um, it is an entry point to art, but it's also this transcendence in how um, imagination, and Anna, this also brings in this idea of magic, which you spoke about has traveled over time in different ways. But for whenever science and art have conferred, it at some point separated, but also in some point came back together, where when we refer to it in a contemporary sense, and I think in your individual practices, you have also spoken about this, is um, how disciplines are collapsing. But say, for instance, when we go back to Namjoon Pike screens, it did seem very new then. So machine learning and AI in the realm of art 
can seem very new now, but it's becoming a fairly fluid definition in the way um, disciplines are collapsing. So considering all of these and how far um, when we go back to history and encyclopedias, it comparatively seems very brief over here. So can you speak about how um, time is for you in relation to AI, but also how do you locate this idea of the future, which just arrives and moves so quickly? Anna? Uh, okay, that, that's a, that's a, a lot of questions all into one because I think so I think kind of like to your first kind of like point I think artists art and science kind of has always had this kind of very kind of like entwined kind of relationship um, ever I think even if you go back to kind of like the Renaissance and earlier I mean Leonardo da Vinci is always the classic example of someone who straddles both and I think it's actually quite a modern idea that there are these two very fixed different things that you need kind of very different mindsets I think kind of like scientists and artists are both very much trying to question the world and understand the world and kind of um and certainly in my practice, I think it's, a very, it's highly scientific. It's kind of like lots of repeating, lots of like um, kind of testing hypothesis, lots of kind of like, um, and I think that, that I think actually kind of like both of them are very, very creative kind of like ways of approaching, approaching kind of like the world and trying to understand it. Um, and I think it's, and I think also there has been this history again of artists taking the latest technologies and trying to use them break them, see kind of where the holes are, where they collapse, do what they're not meant to do with them. And I think this, this wave of kind of like of AI and machine learning art is the latest in that longer trend of, of artists um, kind of working with and pushing the creative potential of things that were designed to, for, to do something else. Um, and then how I consider time and the future in relation to machine learning and artificial intelligence is really interesting. I've been thinking a lot about time um, as part of my practice. I've been thinking a lot about how it works. Um, and I think you have kind of like a variety of different levels of time. You have kind of, um, and you have kind of kind of like clock time so kind of time that has been kind of divided up into kind of like discrete units where kind of like um there's a real desire to make it into smaller like the smallest possible unit um because you know like the second is an invented kind of thing and you know like in science is kind of trying to get it smaller and smaller and smaller um and kind of machines, algorithms all depend on kind of that type of clock time, that type of kind of like time, universal time, which is kind of calibrated um, and kind of decided, which I think is very much in tension, in, in tension with kind of other forms of time, like um, kind of physical time, the time that you experience through your body, how your body kind of changes and also natural ways of telling time. So I've been thinking a lot about cycles, like the sun, uh, like the moon, kind of seasons, um, kind of daylight, all of those are different types of way and ways of telling time and um, kind of like, and I think they're very much in tension um, with these kind of machine driven times. And I think kind of like a question is like yeah. uh, with future, especially with the future and thinking about climate change, um, because time is so inherently kind of tied up with kind of capitalistic practices, whether that is the right form mm. of time to be thinking through kind of like some of these larger questions, whether we need to revert back to more natural ways of telling time. And if that is the case, how do we then encode these technologies into using those forms of time? That's true. I think that also brings in this question of um, this calibration of time and how perhaps we stop thinking because of the number that we see, whereas natural time, it may indicate something else. And I think that comes through with time zones based on um, border politics, based on all of these, which we don't sort of factor in when we are telling time because suddenly we're thinking through what it's supposed to be based on what a clock tells us. Mm. I think it's interesting, and in, I mean, in like very specifically in the 
research and science that's going on. It's about the question of prediction if you talk about time, you know. So we're using a lot of uh, machine learning also for uh, prediction, uh, but that's uh, prediction is a very small time frame in a way. Uh, it's like, I don't know, hours maximum. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, there's also some machine learning involved in um, trying to predict uh, the climate, not just the next week, but maybe months or years. And this is all like for that, of course, you can use um, machine learning systems to to deal with the complexity. But um, to, to answer maybe a little, and so you have like this on the one side, this kind of small steps into the future, into the actual future in terms of prediction. And on the other side, I also noticed more in the field of humanities and some kind of Da Vinci Code artists or something like that, where you start looking at very early texts like the Torah or the Book of Racial and so on, where you have this idea of early forms of a computational language, which is based on mathematical logic and, um, and religious context and so on, where, where now one is starting to you know, bridge this gap in a way between natural language and computational language. Um, to to see that this kind of computational or, or codified language or, or kind of logic language is something that has, has a, a certain history. And then at the moment, I'm also working with two um, crazy Mexican-Spanish artists who are trying to do this Da Vinci code thing. <laughs> so they're uh, analyzing all this stuff, trying to find the codes and then create the tool for prophecies, you know. And I think it's interesting to have this artistic dimension, let's say, of prophecies, um, of trying to imagine that if you look at the stars, we have this kind of block universe uh, time frame where we can predict everything. And at the same time, we have um, the engineers who are trying to predict um, the next minute or the next uh, hour maybe in terms of, of weather or of electricity and movement and so on. So yeah, that's a kind of, Definitely. That's, what, that's kind of the relation what I can answer to your question in terms of time. Yeah, that also brings me to a more specific question I had for Anna, which was, um, and Adrian, perhaps you could come in as well if you have something to add to it is uh, when we're addressing knowledge and intelligence, there's this aspect of um, learning that we attach to something that's developing or what we want to know. And um, that, um, that brings in this idea of the memory generation or storytelling, which is something that I'm also very interested in my research. And I see this extending and morphing into so many different ways through the interception of technology, not just in art, but also um, in other fields, as you discussed. And how, how do we think about narrative in this form of memory that is so temporary, but also that's constructed? Uh, when you're thinking of um, understanding this movement of um, intelligence that is almost fed to us at some point. Hi. Um... I think there's a, it's a very good question because um, I think kind of like when you when you talk about memory in relation to technology, you either have kind of absolute memory, so you have absolutely everything saved down, or you have kind of like um, digital rot, so you have things that are kind of like are 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 kind of like no longer maintained and kind of disappear. Um, and I think kind of like both of those are kind of so different to how we kind of think about kind of memory. Um, there's a really good short story by um, Ted Chang, the uh, life cycle of software objects, I think. Is that the, is that the, right, the correct one? Um, where he talks about kind of like um, memory, how memory, it's not the life cycle of software objects, but it's in that same collection, how memory works and how if you had kind of like a total memory where you have everything saved down, how how that isn't human at all, because like part of human is forgetting um, and the ability to forget and to select. Um, and so I think that's kind of like a tension that sits there. Um, and then I think, and so I think that is very much changing, but I think kind of like 
because the way that you kind of forget using these technologies is um is very different it's kind of and it's kind of more about um kind of like deselecting and things like that so I think there's something there around kind of like um how how kind of like memory exists and how kind of finite also these tools are because the other thing that I find when working with them is that uh, kind of technology that I was using four or five years ago now longer it's totally it no 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 longer works and it's totally broken um and so there's kind of like this finite to them finiteness to them um and the kind of like cycle of them is much shorter I think with that the idea of the archive also becomes um quite complicated because you're not sure what might see or what um how things will be read in the archive totally um and because you know like with the archives i think one of the i came into working with machine learning because of working with archives and collections of data and how much of it is kind of so dependent on kind of like what is in there and also kind of like how it's organized um so the kind of gaps that exist are just amplified by these new technologies um, and atrium i mean with the um how you're thinking through constantly creating new things. I'm also curious about how the documentation takes place in how change is um, being implemented every few hours, as you said. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you were also thinking about? Or how, is, <clears throat> how do you think of, of um, in a way, keeping that process of learning as something that doesn't get repeated as a um, mistake, say, for the future. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, the idea of this um, also like adaptive or lifelong learning or reinforcement learning, you know, it's like to, to build up on, on previous knowledge. It's, it maybe relates a little bit to your question about the future, because in a way you can say that this whole, not just in AI, but the, the technological progress at the moment is happening at such a speed again once again um where where it is where you almost lose this kind of linearity and and you have a kind of exponential growth uh, of of progress or of also of knowledge in terms of training uh data set uh, training algorithms and so on so one tendency at the moment at least in this uh here at the ai center in the, in the broader context is to also focus more on the part of the learning and not so much actually on the on the databases because this just gets extremely big heavy uh, also in a way outdated you have these cases where um, you know you would train something on a database from 2019 and then you wouldn't be aware that uh, covid is a topic or masks or lockdown and so on so in a way it is really um, also a little bit in this idea of the collaborative ai to to be constantly learning and to in that sense also to be more um to a certain degree um forgetting more you know losing having less how do you say weight of the memory and and being better in improvising and uh learning at the moment you know using this idea of them of past experiences and that's a little bit also what anna showed with her um with your GAN generated images where you have this idea of trying to create a, a new original out of the database. So the next step would be to actually to, to have it almost like an exponential curve of learning uh, that that gets rid of the database, but is only on a almost like on a riding the wave like a surfer uh, of of the latest development. You know? And then I think the also the the, we humans become more important again because for example with self-driving cars and so on we can start teaching the ai how to drive or how to be creative and so on so of course dali is also learning from us how we are using it so it's like this you know constant learning situation so to say and um in connection with your responses, I have one last question before we open it up to our audience. Is um, this idea of copyrights and patents 
is extremely significant now when we start thinking about not just creation but <clears throat> contracts and who owns this data and um again considering the speed at which um ai and machine learning brings out um, new information i wanted to bring in this idea of agency and who and where it is located in information that we put out there. And similarly, um, the content that is generated through these um, technological developments. Um, I'll give an example over here. And this is also about how and who takes ownership about moving to the future where the machines are developing this even if it's in a collaborative process. So for instance, something that has been discussed recently is how uh, gender and color biases are coming into algorithms. And um, this comes back to who has access to the initial interactions. So what does this do? It's bringing back the human in terms of how we look at the human mind and intelligence and uh, so to say humanness itself as machines are taking over in this mm -hmm. future data i think it's like it's um it's two two topics you are striking here so the one is um this how do you uh, like the idea of where do we get the data from so uh, you know not just images of faces uh, also names for example your name is much more difficult for an ai to recognize if it's male or female mm. uh, than my name for example or or anna's name so there's like these uh, problems with the with the nlp programs and this kind of uh, how they also call it digital colonialism where you have um you know these data sets on the one side all trained more or less in western parts of the world on white faces um and and of course then you have still in a lot of uh, colonial countries still the especially i guess in indian uh, you know people tagging basically or training helping the ai to to do the the the, um, the annoying work and then on the other side you have also this question of copyright which might be challenging anna as an author at the moment because I think it was recently, I don't know if it was in the UK or the US, where they said that any AI generated art doesn't have any copyrights um, as from the artist itself. So I found it quite interesting because my colleague here at the AI Center, Nora, who's also working with uh, AI um, applications, she was like directly like, oh my God. And I thought, but that's actually good. You know, you have like this idea with a lot of scientists also where you where you have an open source uh, of your art or you kind of have this hacker mentality and just give it out. But then it doesn't only challenge the question of copyright, but also the question of authorship. So if there's no copyright anymore, Anna will lose her status as an artist pretty soon because she can't be an author anymore. And I think this is... For me, it's interesting to see how with, I don't know why exactly AI, but with AI, how it's challenging this, in a way, romantic ideas of creativity, talent, genius, authorship, and so on, which have been promoted in philosophy, at least in France and Germany in the last century, a lot kind of post-structuralist um, ideas and so on, how they are now actually, thanks to AI, getting really, how would you say? Uh, urgent and uh, challenging for artists. Yeah. It also pushes away ownership in some ways. So if something becomes problematic and it's the public realm, mm -hmm. who do you pin down then? Then does it go back to the person who generated it? You're like in the anarchy again, because mm -hmm. property is theft, as uh, Proudhon said. No? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anna, would you like to... Yeah, to, I think it's really interesting kind of like ideas around copyright and ownership, because um, so one of the kind of uh, one of the parallels that I kind of often think about when I work with kind of machine learning is around kind of uh, gardening and nature and kind of uh, growing. And there is also kind of a case in America from like, I think, the 1990s around an artist who tried to copyright a garden and it was turned down because you couldn't um you couldn't predict how the plants would grow 
um, was the reasoning that they for kind of turning it down. And I think so. I think there's kind of like something there around kind of like the concept versus kind of like the kind of creation of the work when you're an artist kind of where does that kind of like can you copyright kind of those so I'm not actually surprised that they they denied copyright to um, AI artists but I do think kind of like there is work involved when you make this stuff um, and how how is that kind of like uh, valued um, I when I kind of like um, make work and kind of to kind of go back to data, I always try and kind of create my own databases. I always try and kind of to kind of like buy the object and then kind of photograph it myself so that I kind of like have full ownership of it and I'm aware of what goes in and what is not in there. Um, but for kind of like some of these newer kind of technologies and techniques like, um, like uh, stable diffusion, which I was sharing earlier, you just need so much information or you know you're even if you're fine tuning it on your own data there's still this kind of like huge amount that sits underneath it um and it's kind of like impossible to kind of like be aware and to understand everything that kind of um that is there and for me that kind of like is really feels very kind of weird to use it because I don't have control over it and I don't I can't kind of understand what goes in it and um, I'm just going to extend that to a question that's coming to you from the audience, which is about how most examples of art and ML are either text or image based, and what and how can we talk about art and AI that is more than just these two methods of art making, which I think also connects with what you just spoke about um, this generation of um, images. What was mm. the question? I didn't quite get it. Most Sorry. examples of art and ML or AI are either text or image based. What or how can we talk about art and AI that is more than just these two methods of art making? Mm -hmm. I think it's um, in my um, small experience, maybe Anna can say more about it. It's, it's, um, you can see how they are using basically these two tools, more or less um, like NLP and um, and image generation in different fields. So, for example, in in um, uh, in theater, uh, the, the question of like working with NLP programs with GPT three and so on, trying to improvise together with the like say a chatbot or something, is still like language based, but it is of course not. It's not about text, it's about theater and performance or uh, in certain um, the moment we're also working with a choreographer on the idea of how you can interact with with your basically videos and audios and so on. So but in in the basic structure, it's still the same two fields of um, image generation and uh, and, and uh, NLP language language processing. There's also sound artists working in these fields and I think as far as I experienced or, or learned or not just from artists but also from the scientists here is that machine learning is uh, is used a lot in terms of um, making a better resolution of stuff you know so mm -hmm. and analyzing data so in that sense like we have here a, a lab on um, what was it at nanoparticles systems engineering where it's about you know, stitching tissue together and have a better three-dimensional resolution of the temperature, for example. So in that sense, it's still kind of computer vision, but in a different dimension, not just um, uh, on a visual basis, but also on, on um, temperature. So I think, yeah, yeah it's striking <laughs> all fields of art, um, but the technology in that sense is, mm. if you break it down, it's not so broad <laughs> a third field would be robotics maybe that's uh, something that we also work in a lot too. yeah okay. i was gonna i was gonna mention robotics as well being another area where i think mm -hmm. there's a lot of kind of creative potential and then there's also kind of i suppose um 
kind of like maybe even like a fourth category, which is kind of like AI as inspiration. So mm -hmm. you're having kind of artists make work using protein folding, kind of and taking that as kind of the inspiration to then kind of create work, um, which isn't kind of um, kind of sculptural work or or kind of other artists using kind of um, how this stuff is being. Um, designed or thought about as kind of inspiration for screenplays or something like that so it's kind of like also kind of as a source of inspiration as rather than just a tool for making um, which then again broadens it out into multiple different fields and then also what you said about sound and um, I can see Farah as one of the participants but for future landing Farah and up in a uh, both worked with sound in the first iteration, which involved viewers um, participating with the screen. In Farah's work, it meant um, that your environmental sound became a part of how the image was generated, so it wasn't only based on text. And that's a lot of how she works, but also what Abhinay did is he coded in, um, and this also, I think, comes into how we attract in some way um, across devices, across apps, um, but based on viewers' locations, um, it generated different sounds as a composition. Uh, so I think there are these explorations across various disciplines too. Uh, there's um, another question from Erica, which um, I'll just read it out. Classification. There's also also, Nicole Seiler is in the chat, who's a choreographer who's working with AI, as far as Kamya told me. Yeah, so we have almost all disciplines here. <laughs> um, so Erica has a couple more questions. Uh, one is classification and prediction seem to be the basics, the basis for AI and machine learning, which seem to be a normative human-centered thinking. Even the concept of learning and how one learns is codified into machine learning, like RNNs. What could happen if we try different algorithms not based on rote memory? On what memory? On rote memory. Okay. I think on memory that we've uh, learned or based on a subjective memory mm -hmm. that has been taught to us. And I think the encyclopedia perhaps comes in there as well. Do you mean, uh, sorry, this is probably a question for Erica. Do you mean a type of um, memory that is not based on repetition? Mm -hmm. That is parroted back, like, Erica says. Because I think, mm -hmm. um, from my understanding of how this stuff works, at least kind of like um, the types that the type that kind of like the types of um, technology that I use when I train it, it's kind of it's always repeating. Kind of like you go through these different cycles of epochs during the training to kind of um, as it kind of builds up, kind of like the knowledge and comes becomes better and better and better, and so kind of repetition as a process is always is kind of like inherently there um, when it's kind of when I'm kind of like building my models and so to take that away I'm not quite sure if it would work in the same way. I, yeah hi maybe it'd be easier if I just talk it instead of trying to type it. <laughs> and maybe rote isn't the right word. Um, I was thinking about GANs to, um, and the idea of a ad, even the term general adversarial network, um, the idea of adversarial where you are in training, a mission, in, in training again, you are always going referring back until you get it right. And um, I'm just thinking about how those methods of learning are almost in a sense that forcing something to conform to a, a strict way of understanding something and you're not correct until you get it right. 
which is sort of an example of just most people's experience of going to school and learning. So um, I guess some of the things that I that uh, concern me are these just ideas of what learning is and how it's how it's created and how those learning of uh, human learning has been transferred into artificial intelligence and machine learning. But it's only such a narrow, even learning is such a narrow thing as, as on its own. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What would be, I, I mean, do, maybe you have an idea of what an alternative form of learning would be. I mean, what me strikes me a lot is like, even if you're talking about intelligence at the moment, uh, and also the, if you, all these terms are basically copies from neuroscience, biology, et cetera. And we're basically trying to make a digital copy, teaching computers how to see as humans and so on. Um, so in that sense, it is not very surprising that even the way we learn is um, copied from humans because maybe our imagination is a bit limited in terms of uh, trying to figure out different ways of learning or different kinds of uh, intelligences. I mean, there's like some ideas in, in, in relation to plants or to animals, but even that you could say is to a certain degree very uh, a narrow-minded way of thinking because we could say, okay, if you have an artificial intelligence, will we really be totally artificial and not related to any biological uh, being, so to say? But yeah, maybe, I don't know, do you have an idea of what a different kind of learning could be? Do I specifically? Yes. I don't know, as an artist, um, I'm working with uh, artificial intelligence and look, looking more into robotics and learning. Mm -hmm. And um, that's sort of where I'm at. I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so that would be maybe more a kind of embodied uh, way of learning things like or embodied yeah. intelligence. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sort of exploring um, those ideas of sort of the four E, um, you know, embodied, emergent, e extended, and externalized learning in mm -hmm. cognitive science. Um, but I don't even think I got those four right. Mm -hmm. I have learning disabilities, so this is why this is interesting to me. Uh, um, and memory is a problem. So, <laughs> uh, but um, I think I think um, exploring learning as an emergent field, mm -hmm. or even intelligence as an emergent field with um, multiple things coming together at once, is where an intelligence sort of becomes how one represents that in an artistic way um, is an interesting question that mm -hmm. I don't have an answer for, <laughs> I guess. I think it's also interesting in, like when I started working here, I tried to figure out, so what exactly is AI? Like what kind of fields? And there was this separation you would have like with NLP, uh, computer vision, machine learning, robotics and so on and and this is like an old definition from i don't know 15 years ago or something and at the moment the ai field has kind of narrowed down to machine learning in that sense so like working with aparna for example uh, she isn't allowed to say she's doing ai because she's only working with robots and there's no real machine learning involved although she's working with algorithms and so on but I think what, so we said, maybe we can just call it embodied AI. So to say we can actually learn through motion and through uh, robots, a different kind of um, intelligence. And what she's actually doing is basically using motion to, to, um, to train her algorithm, you know? So it's a kind of actually, yeah, the, in that sense, a real embodied AI. But yeah, but the field has kind of, become more specialized in, 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 in basically machine learning and, and uh, natural language processes. Yes, I, I've made the mistake once of saying uh, artificial general intelligence and then being told that that doesn't exist. So you mm -hmm. can't use that term. <laughs> That's the, the, the dystopian or utopian dimension. No? <laughs> With that, are there any other questions? Or as Kamiya said, if any, if you would like to unmute and ask, um, or even just comment on anything that's been shared this evening.
um, I just like to, because the topic being intelligence and, and learning in the age of AI. So one of the biggest things that we were discussing in a project that I'm collaborating uh, with another artist is about machine learning and we're spending so much time, effort and you know, trying to learn from it and also to feed the machine the way we would like it to be. The various kinds of things. In fact, we are being quite uh, careful about what are the things we are feeding. For example, right now, everything is in English. What about the various other languages, cultures, etc.? So that is another another thing to go into. You know, each of these concepts have very deep rabbit holes that we need to think about and the impact that it has. Uh, but at the same time, just on the very superficial, on, on the on the surface. We're spending so much effort and time and resources on machine learning. We are finding a very clear disconnect with um, our real natural world and the learning that we are giving to our actual human children of living in that natural world. So is there a way that, say for example, there are children who are using apps to learn about flora and fauna, and it's an AI driven app which has been taught about it. So that's a very nice example where we are feeding a machine and then that learning is coming back uh, in a way and we are kind of collaborating and the process of learning is mutual, uh, which eventually the more collaborative the process of uh, intelligence and its development and learning processes are, uh, I think the less, um, the more useful it is overall for our lives. Apart from the art and the beautiful stuff that's coming out, it's, it's really beautiful. So I, I was just wondering whether there are any ways of actively, you know, where each one of us are participating in this whole dance uh, on the next, you know, each of us in our own way, as artists or as uh, technician, technologists or as, uh, you know, people are curating. Is there, is there some way that we can have these conversations where we think about these things you know, on, and use the technologies with a little more thought um, when we are doing things? So I, I don't know if I, it's, I don't know if it's a question or if it's more if it's open to a discussion or some thoughts that you might have in that area of human learning and machine learning and you know, finding a balance there. Any thoughts if anyone has or has been working in an area where I'm not aware of? Yeah, let's stay in a kind of associative space, you know. <laughs> so I was just thinking of a conversation I had last week at the at the HEC, where also Anna exhibited. Um and over there, uh a guy, Roland Fisher, he mentioned this, um, how was it called, um, face recognition um, tool they were using in China to identify um, criminal faces, so to say. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, everybody would go and say, no, you can't do that because it's like, it's not ethical, it's uh, racist to a certain degree. But the app or this AI was actually very good in, in showing what faces are um, criminal and let's say there were more kind of asymmetric faces or faces with I don't know a big nose dark eyebrows etc and but then it's like the discussion in that sense stopped in this point where you say it is it is a very biased uh, application but in that sense you can also like what, what Roland was saying like it's the way you ask yourself what is this app actually telling us you know it's telling us that in our society or in China or wherever, people with a crooked nose are stigmatized and at the border of society. And that's why they become, they have a tendency to become more criminal because it is us as humans who are basically pushing them over there. So in that sense, this um, face recognition app had actually, um, I don't know, identified a certain tendency. And I think that's, in a way, the question was last week, like, what can we learn from AI? And I think quite often the discussion stops on this, let's say, more kind of um, uh, uh, scandalous or superficial level where you actually stop asking 
deeper questions and, and go more into it and have a more uh, diverse uh, discussion um, about what is actually happening. So I think um, that's, yeah, that's, that's maybe a, a, a potential answer to what you were saying, or just a reaction uh, to it. Um, yeah, so I think it's, for me, it's, it tells me a lot about how we humans think and how we humans uh, try to define things. Also with this Google Lambda uh, con sentient AI, it is not so much the question, is it really sentient or not? It is more like, what? how do we define what sentient is? And how well did he actually program him, the, the app or the, the chatbot or whatever, to convince himself that it's actually sentient? So it's like this kind of you know feedback loop, which is um, yeah, which is great to a certain degree. But if you just stop in this uh, level of sensation, I think a lot of things get lost. So that's uh, maybe a bit the point I want to make. Yeah, I really like what you were saying that like AI is just a mirror of kind of the world that we live in. Um, I think that's very true. I think for me, kind of like how I approach it or at least how I try to kind of be sensitive to it is by kind of trying to make as much of it as possible myself. So I kind of understand how it's constructed and understand um, understand kind of everything that goes in it and the decisions that are being made um, as much as possible. Um, or if it's not possible, or if it's not possible, at least trying to understand how the thing has been built um, and kind of trying to invert the kind of speed that you kind of like have with the systems and replace it with the slowness um, is at least how how as a as a single human I'm trying to kind of like approach um, this big system mm -hmm. kind of ideas and structure. It's a big problem also for like also here at the ASM we have some they call they are called theoreticians like <laughs> they basically try to understand what is happening in the black box of these machine learning systems you know. And over there, we are still kind of catching up because it's, as you said before, and uh, it's kind of magic, but uh, we still need to figure out what is actually in terms of um, of mathematics and and, uh, and informatics happening over there. You know? So it's because otherwise we can't, if you use it in medicine or wherever, we won't trust because we don't know what is in the black box. Yeah. So. It's this kind of, how would you say, explainability and interpretability that you are practicing as well in that sense. Yeah. And I think it also brings back, in a sense, um, repetition when we go back to thinking of mediums and new forms. Because while right now AI may have initially been just a medium um, for of exploration, of creating new things, it reminds me also what um, happened with photography and the lens in some sense, because it was just initially um, experimenting with what the camera could do. And then um, one went on to think about how um, the Kodak gold film was invented because it couldn't photograph, I mean, because um, it was just a bias towards photographing um, only, um, and because of how it's been trained and made, is only um, white skin, and that's why for blacks they never got the colors, right? So Kodak Gold came about, and that's how. I mean, so it's also how I think once the familiarity of medium is something that people start thinking about, um, or it becomes more normal, so to say, you start looking at these biases and then start unraveling those over time, which may be something similar to what is happening with AI as. Um, be brought up to mm -hmm. yeah. i think it's uh, i was at a couple of lectures or talks on, on the question of biases and regulations and so on and it always comes to this point which is a little bit also what roland basically said is we can't get rid of the biases just by in, uh, applying the right programming or cleaning up the data sets and so on because the biases are part of our society so and of our human civilization so it always it doesn't really matter how how deep you get you always are kind of thrown back to the problem that even the whole computer science ai etc is part of 
of human civilization. So it's just in that sense, the only thing you can do is, of course, train yourself in awareness and try to work in that direction. Um, but there's no kind of magic formula that would, uh, I don't know, solve the bias problem, which might also be quite dangerous if you get rid of all biases. Wensi has a question. Hey, Wensi, yeah. Hi. So I want to take on from the uh, from where Upasana has talked about collaboration. Now, when we look at open source code and we look at coding, there's been a whole history of people contributing to it, right? Now, when you look at AI, it learns, and when it makes a mistake, it learns, and it spreads that learning to the entire network of its system. But then how does this knowledge come back to us? Because that's AI learning, it's the growth potential of AI. Where is that equal sharing and collaboration between AI and humans? Because at the end of the day, the nuts and bolts of it, it's still a software, it's still a hardware, which is under regimes of intellectual property rights and controlled by organizations. What interface I may interact with is only permissible by a certain organization and that collaboration is very defined by it. The question again of whatever knowledge that I may want, okay, how do I do protein synthesis? How do I, you know, make this image with that image is a defined set of parameters. It's not an open-ended question base, right? And it's defined by the power structure of that equation. For me, when you look at AI and open AI and collaboration, and especially anarchy, where is the symbiotic relationship between human and this Cooperation-owned AI. Is the question to me or to Anna or? No, all of means it's an open conversation. An open conversation. Because, because this is. I think it's, it's maybe more in terms like what I experience here is also that um, also in terms of speeds of research going on and trying to keep up. A lot of scientists, uh, they can't, it's not so much about, they say it's not about concurrence, it's more about collaboration. So the idea how you can keep up is by sharing everything on, on GitHub or whatever. But this also implies, and uh, that's maybe a little bit the direction Wensi was heading towards, is that uh, they're not just, you know, sincere um, master students or PhD researchers can go and get the codes, but also of course, uh, military dictatorships can get like the code for self-driving or autonomous flying drones, for example. So these are a lot of ethical questions that are involved in these topics. And and then the other part, which I think Wensley was also hinting towards, is this the problem of the big five, basically. That's we have these five big companies that are have a lot more resources than even you know any federal or any institute of technology or university or whatever even if it's like here uh, based on swiss government money but also google is supporting the federal institute of technology so i think over there it is i don't know how to answer that question it is a question of copyright it is a question of ownership um it is, of course, uh, one can try and um, you know talk to them, influence them, try to uh, have these researchers that work there come maybe here or to institutes and do research and then change their mindsets to an anarchist and bring them back or something like that. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if that kind of answers uh, your input, Wensi, but um, yeah, or maybe Anna can. And or oh, well, gonna... Anna, go ahead. Oh no, I mean, I don't have. I mean, it's 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 not a question where there is kind of a pat answer. Like it's it's as as Adrian was saying, it's you know this very complicated kind of like interplay of different people and kind of like ethics and and all of these different things. I mean, that anything that I would kind of like add to kind of like how, like the impact that kind of like these large corporations are having on the field is that you can also, and I don't know if you've seen this, Adrian, but the way that kind of like, as you said, like they have like such a huge amount of money that they're kind of sucking up all of the scientists from academia 
and it is and because of that and the various other things it is kind of swaying even the academic research field to be to respond to the drivers of industry um they have like such a huge kind of like an oversized impact into kind of like what is being researched and what is deemed to be kind of like important research questions mm -hmm. um, i think that's also another way that kind of like research they're shaping research the way that kind of like um a lot of the latest kind of machine learning research is predicated on having access to huge amounts of gpus um because hardware is also you know everyone talks about algorithms but hardware i think is also a really important part of the equation as to kind of how you can build an experiment and test mm -hmm. all of the the latest systems are designed for, you know, like, uh, very, very expensive to run um, unless you're part of an institution or an organization. It's very difficult to do it as a solo person or a small research lab. Um, so I think that's another way that where there's kind of like the, those questions of access and ownership and locking people out. Mm. I mean, the, the, the way the AI Center is trying to deal with this problem or the ETH is on the one side of this money coming, for example, from Google, but into a foundation. So basically, they, you know, they get the tax reduction and so on, but, uh, but they can't define what kind of research is done. You know? So it's like, it's kind of this um, Swiss cleaning uh, issue <laughs> so, you know you get the body and then you distribute it but you can't influence what kind of research you can say okay i'm interested in ai or machine learning or reinforcement learning but it's not an applied um, science this is like one way but there's also other ways where companies can of course um, finance direct um, research for example eth has a disney research studio which is financed by by the Disney company and so on. So yeah, it's I think what, what my boss likes to say, it's more about, um, how would you say, changing the mindsets of the talents of the future. So actually we're trying to, you know, by doing these seminars on the bachelor level, trying to, you know, imply or implement this critical thinking ethics uh, ideas already in the people that will in, fut in the future be, the CEOs of these uh, companies. So that's uh, maybe a little bit more trying to change the mentality than trying to change the, the system that's already existing. John had a question on abstraction and um, artistic fingerprints. Uh, John, would you like to unmute and ask the question? So. Yeah, hello. I think you've sort of answered it a little bit already since I typed it in. It was kind of the uh, the, the, uh, the, my question was on the idea of uh, we're talking about the tools that we use to make the art and in the process of making the art we kind of break the tools a little bit to make the art look more like something we would make kind of speaking and sweeping statements and I wondered how much do you break the tools to make your art to make it look like make it look more like an Anna Riddler piece I think that like I'm constantly trying to use technologies that weren't designed necessarily to do I'm using technologies which were designed for a different purpose I think kind of like I'm not necessarily trying to make it mimic my own style I think what comes out will reflect maybe my style because it's what I'm interested in but I'm not trying to like teach it to copy my style or teach it to behave like me. I think the thing that kind of runs through all of my projects is kind of like conceptual ideas rather than necessarily like it looks a certain way. Um, I think the way that I kind of can influence maybe kind of aesthetically what a piece looks like for me is very much not like at that data, the, the, the um, kind of like with the data set and kind of what I put into it. Um, rather than kind of necessarily kind of like tinkering about with it after like after kind of like it's generated but for me I think yeah I'm I'm trying to push the boundaries of what has been created and I think kind of like yeah the aesthetics are are kind of like come come kind of like with it if that makes sense sorry I'm answering this very badly 
um, but I'm thinking it through on the fly. I've been discussing this with uh, like uh, a friend of mine, artist Carlos Morales, who's also now playing a little around with this um, uh, different image generation programs. And we were wondering, like, for example, why why is it so, in terms of abstraction, why are we so eager to have kind of realistic um, or like natural, real images of, like, if you say, I want to have a rhino, why does it have to look like a real rhino in that sense? I think we had like this conclusion that maybe it's a little bit like an art history where at the beginning we tried to mimic art and then we needed three, four hundred years to get into abstraction. And and even not just in, in this image generation, but also in, you know, copying neural networks, etc. It's all a kind of trying to be as realistic as possible. Maybe it's a little bit the same idea of why human intelligence is copied into an artificial intelligence. Why don't we just try something totally abstract? But maybe it's just actually a question of development. Like we see it in art history, where for 300 years we were trying to be as realistic as possible. And then we had photography and now, um, and then you could get abstract. So maybe with this again generated images, it might have a similar uh, development. I don't know. But it's really, it's, it's interesting that the first approach would be to have it as realistic as, prob as possible. Thank you for that. And um, I just realized we've overstepped on time. Um, thank you so much, uh, Anna, Adrian, everybody in the audience who um, made this discussion so interactive and engaging and uh, to the entire the fantastic and future everything team. Kamya, I'll hand that over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I mean, you've said it all. So thanks to you, Virangana. And for everybody who has been here and hung out with us for the last one and a half hours, please come back for our other dialogue sessions. We're going to host one every month uh, up until January. So please make sure for those of you who are still here to come back and log in and hang out and chat and contribute your energy towards this scary, promising, exciting, filled with potential, contradictory, nascent field of work. <laughs> and yes, also we're kind of ready to announce our festival for those of you who will be in Bangalore in March, please keep in touch and come by and, you know, where we'll be presenting a lot of conversations as well as artworks and performances that have dabbled with AI, explored AI, experimented, taken the bull by the horns, you know, different artists are approaching it differently. So would love to have all of you join us on this journey. So with that, good night and good luck. See you soon. Can I show a last image from my small... Uh exercises with the uh, image generation sure which yeah. one who, who are and you hanging it, out with it's a it's a portrait of uh, Wensi. Um, <laughs> yeah. so this is mid journey and uh, i've been talking about a lot about uh, albert durer's rhino so he's being anarchist on a beach in goa. in goa this is what the result is and this would be with um stable fusion which is a little bit <laughs> Better action. Oh. So we are, we're bringing back the rhino to the Bowen beaches. <laughs> and how do you feel at the end of this exercise, Adrian? Good. I mean, I think it's, uh, I don't know why it has become here, you know, so abstract. Maybe because of anarchism. I don't know. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it brings out the artists and everybody. And that's something that's exciting as well. It's something we are beginning to explore, right? Like, uh, yeah, if that's you have a, nice a bit thing, of an right? imagination that can tickle something, look at where it can go. Yeah. It's amazing in a weird way. Thank so you very much. everybody experiments and dabbles with this and really contributes to that, that swarm of intelligence. I think the more we collectively put back into this thing the more robust or unbiased or 
um, you know, mature it can get. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much and stay in touch. Thank you. you too. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>